started. There we go. Let's see if we can bring everything up here. All right. Orientation is locked, it's telling me. We'll get the hang of it. Stand by. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to live stream Fridays. Ordinarily, we will do this with... Uh, sorry, it's a little bit blurry there. Ordinarily, we'll do this with our Patreon folks, but... Uh, I thought maybe this week, since I'm working on uh, a pedal board here, that we might take some Q&A and we can stop periodically as the as the rig is being built and you can ask questions, whether that's pertaining to things related to the rig build or whether that's things pertaining to your own pedal board or frustrations or things of that nature. And we can talk about that. Um, this could be about gear, tone, our pedals, pedal boards, whatever it is that you want to talk about, we can talk about. I'm uh, just to kind of give you a sense of where we are uh, as it relates to this rig. Let me invert us again. Let's see what we got here. Hopefully that's clearish. I'll move a few things over so we can see a little better. Slightly better. Let's move down. Move everything down. We've got a kind of a potpourri of things, including a tennis racket regrip. <laughs> For those of you tennis players out there, um, in any case, we're working on this rig, and uh, this has just been a rig that's been kind of here for a while and I've kind of periodically been working on it. It's got some cool pedals on it. Um, and I'm just wiring everything into the, uh, the True Tone CS12 power supply as we speak. Uh, I've built a custom interface for this, which is up here in the corner. Let me just move this back just a little bit more so you can see a little bit better angle. Um, and so we're just going to continue to uh, to work on the power, and uh, periodically I'll, I'll, I'll come up for air, and we can do some Q&A, and if you have stuff that you want to talk about, we can do that in the meantime. Um, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to start soldering. Got my soldering iron here, and uh, we're just going to go for it. One, one tip that I like to do, uh, just so I don't you know, damage pedals. So I'll use like shirts that I get at the thrift store or sometimes even uh, underwear or undergarments. I'll use those quite a bit too because they, uh, they're not abrasive and so they won't scratch up the pedals. Sometimes if you use like really uh, kind of like bristly towels, it can sometimes scratch up the pedals a little bit. And so I try to avoid that, but Today we have a shirt. I wish I had some underwear to show you. That would have been a little cooler. Um, one thing, too, that I should tell you that I'm doing here as it relates to the, the pedal board um, is typically I'll route all of the cables and kind of just leave them long like this as it kind of comes into the power supply. And then if there's specific voltage things that need to be addressed, I'll, I'll kind of route them accordingly here. So the only one that's... I guess there's a few that are a little unusual. We have the whammy, which is AC. And so I kind of did that one first and I kind of put like a red um, piece of heat shrink around it just so if somebody's ever teching this that's not me, they'll know that this is a, a different voltage um, and that they wouldn't want to plug that into anything else. Um, and then we have two pedals that we're running at 18. One is this Echoes R and then the other is the uh, vertex buffer interface kind of custom one that I made. And this can run, uh, this one can run up to 36 volts. Uh, it's not exactly the same as the one that you could get from us, which is already running internally at max headroom. This one, you can change the voltage that's coming into it um, because it's not like our standard PCB 
uh, version that you would buy from, you know, Sweetwater or whatever retailer you would buy our stuff from. So this is a little bit different because it's customized. Um, and I'll probably do some some different color heat shrink on those as well, just so that there isn't any confusion as to the 18 volt related pedals and that nobody gets that wrong. Otherwise, all this other stuff, I believe, is actually there's one thing that, that's different. This dimension C up on the top, this is also the early boss stuff is 12 volts DC. And you can mod them pretty easily to be 9 volt DC, but uh, this it doesn't have that mod. So uh, that's, that will also be run at uh, one of the 12 volt outputs, which is no problem because uh, you, can, uh, you can switch the, the voltage on this between 9 and 12 very easily. Let's get to some soldering. I don't know how well you can see these. These are Kobe Con 2.1 millimeter by 5.5 millimeter uh, DC plugs. This is pretty much what I use. And I think not just me, I think almost every rig builder uses some version of this as uh, what they terminate to when they're customizing their power cables. And we're just using the existing power cables that come with the uh, the power supply, and then we just cut them down to length. And that's that's what I've done here is just cutting them down to length. There's no reason to buy or make your power cables from scratch. It's not like a guitar cable where there can be a, a really important sonic aspect to using a specific type of cable. It's not the same type of thing. The parameters are totally different. As long as it can fulfill the voltage and current delivery that is required there is no benefit to one cable over the other i prefer the ones that are more like coaxial style like this um, this one just has two center conductors no shield but there are some that have like a seam in the middle uh, that separates the you know what would be going to the tip or to the uh, sleeve or the ground I don't like those so much, uh, mostly because, not for any functional reason, they just don't dress very well if you're trying to make a beautiful or neat uh, wire run. It's really hard to do it when they have that seam. It's a lot easier if it's rounded up. I like this guy is. After I terminate one, I'll, I'll put a zip tie just to kind of hold the housing together. I think it's the the simplest way to do it. And again, this is something that people have done for probably 30 or more years when using these types of plugs. They will often zip tie them shut. I've seen some people that use uh, like silicone or some sort of adhesive in there. I generally don't do that because if you need to make a repair, it's, you know, irreparable if you do that once the silicon goes in you can't make any changes you're having to replace the the plug and at least part of the cable and then that may mean that you need to replace the entire cable because uh there's no there's not enough there's not enough length anymore if you cut it down to the the amount of uh silicone that's that's kind of covering everything so i usually don't recommend doing that By the way, this uh, third hand here has a rubberized bottom, so I can kind of throw it on top of stuff and not have to worry about it damaging any sort of pedals or anything like that. That's why I don't have a t-shirt underneath it.
Add another zip tie. And we've done a few cables, so let's let's come up for air here and we'll, we'll take some questions that have come up. And then uh, we will come back. We'll come back to our uh, to our power supply wiring. All right, that's looking good. It's looking good in there. All right, let's break for a moment. All right, let's see if we can straighten this out. All right, questions that have come in. Evening Mason, and it's it's afternoon here, but <laughs> pretty much everywhere else, it's not afternoon. Uh, all right, so the question is, any thoughts on ABY switchers and what to look for? Uh, so I think most of the ABY switchers that are out there are not isolated. So it's just like some sort of splitter. Some of them are active, some of them are passive. I would look for ones that are isolated. So that would be like, Laylee has one that's isolated uh, and uses high quality transformers. Um, who else has got nice ones? I think Mesa Boogie actually had an AB switch for a while that was pretty good that I think Mario Marino designed from uh, Axis Electronics. And I'm sure that that one's good too. Um, I'm trying to think of who else makes a good one that I know of. Most of like the Morley and stuff like that is not that good. Uh, I mean, it's not isolated. It's often not active. So you don't have any sort of buffering to drive that split or drive the transformer if there is a transformer. I think Laylee is probably the gold standard. I would start there if I were you and I was looking for something, uh, you know, high quality. Philip B, what's up, guitar friends? Vince, what's up, man? Hello from Portugal. Haven't seen this angle or the workshop in a while. Yeah, this was this is a whole new space from what what once was <laughs> used to be the garage. So this is kind of like storage area, and uh, you know, got guitar cases and some photo stuff. You know, and it's all it's all back here, uh, and then this is the workbench area here. So yeah, a little different angle than usual. Uh, Colin, any ideas on how to back feed power to a buffer on a pedal board with no power? It's just expression controllers. Any ideas on how to back feed power to a buffer on a pedal board with no power? I'm not sure what, what, what that means, Colin. Can you clarify that question? And I'd be happy to answer it. Hit the likes. Yeah, so you don't forget. Don't forget. <laughs> Thanks for that. Made it. Been off to the net for a hot minute. Getting finals taken care of. School sucks. Well, you're doing it, though. Good for you, Stan. I like to put painter's tape on the tips that are not 9 volt. There can be a million different ways to, um, to identify that for yourself. You know, painter's tape is obviously, uh, you know, kind of a temporary solution. It'd be nice to be blessed with steady hands. <laughs> Sean. It's like, hey, that's my board. It is. <laughs> Greetings. Love the POV vibe. Maybe I'll get like a GoPro, you know, uh, and, a, and a chess camera and all that stuff. It'll really be, we can do a, uh, a VR rig build. Uh, I'm going to use my polytune for my input buffer. What do you recommend for the output buffer? Well, if you want to stick with TC, you could you could go with the bona fide buffer on the output as well. Could be another thing that you could do. You could uh, Mesa Boogie makes some standalone ones called a Stowaway. Um, True Tone makes one I think called like the Pure Tone buffer. Those could all be options. Would using something like a Carl Martin compressor limiter in my signal chain allow me to slightly control the volume of my amp? Looking to keep the effect, uh, the effect my MP1 was having, uh, was having in my loop. Well, I mean, you have a gain control, so you could use it to do some leveling and limiting if you wanted. Um, but if it's in front of the amp, and I'm not sure if you're saying it's in front of the amp or you're using it in a loop, but in front of the amp, you know, it's going to just affect sort of the amp, the, the how much the preamp is being driven. Uh, if it's in the effects loop, then, you know, it's going to, 
affect how much you're driving the power amp or leveling out any differences between the preamp and the power amp. Uh, Martin, I think, or Martin, thanks for uh, answering my question. Sure. Sean is so stoked. What solder temperature is ideal for pedal and guitar internals? Don't want to damage stuff. I think it depends on uh, what it is that you're soldering. I usually will change my tip size depending on what I'm working on and probably the temperature as well. So uh, if it's a really like if you're if you're doing a guitar where it has, you know, the the claw like a strat or something like that where there's like a bridge claw in the back and it's really thick and you need to solder a ground wire to that, you need a lot of heat transfer very quickly. So using a thicker tip uh, and probably also a thicker solder is going to be easier for you to get in and out of there really quickly without doing any damage to anything or overheating anything. Uh, with something like guitar pedals, you can use a much smaller or thinner tip. Like this is probably somewhere in between. Uh, and I don't know the exact size of this particular tip. Um, I can try to look that up for you and maybe post that in the, uh, in the comment section later on. But I'll change the size of the tip to reflect what it is that I'm soldering. If they're like really small surface mount components and I'll make this like a super small tip uh, for the pedal board stuff, I kind of use something that's maybe to the maybe mid, mid to small size tip that can kind of do anything, whether I want to do guitar cables or whether I want to do uh, the DC power cables. These are a little trickier, I'd say, with a tip this size. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you have some skills with soldering and, you, and you're pretty proficient. Um, probably like a, a less skilled version, you know, or like a, you know, 15 or 20 year ago iteration, uh, of, of, uh, of me wouldn't probably use this tip because it would be a little too hard. Uh, cause it's just, you know, you have to have the right dexterity to make it work. Um, with small little components like these, you know, the tabs on, on these power plugs are pretty, are pretty small. You know, so you have to you have to be pretty precise when you're doing it, um, but you, I think you you would you would adjust you would adjust I think. Um, but like the temperature I have it on right now is is uh, about seven hundred, and you could probably maybe go up to seven fifty, but maxing it out and I and I see some people do that. It doesn't really do anything more for you other than just burn out your tips faster. Um. Soren, hello from Copenhagen. Um, enjoy the channel. Great pleasure. Great. Copenhagen. I've been using an electroharmonic switchblade for years. It's pretty okay. <laughs> um, does exactly what I wanted and need it for. Not sure if it's isolated. It's definitely not isolated. Um, back feed power from the rack to the buffer pedal on the pedal board for longer cable runs. So guitar, buffer, rack. Um, so, I mean, you could get like, uh, some of the broadcast cables will be like kind of almost like built in snakes where you have like, you know, really low capacitance and maybe like three or four coaxes under one, um, like one sleeving you, and if you, so if you're trying to get basically three lines out to the board, like a, you know, a send and return and a nine volt. You could try to use something like that to do it. And, you know, most of the bigger cable companies make stuff like that. Like Belden in particular is one that stands out. Uh, I think Gepco and Canari also make stuff like that that are more for like video broadcasts where you'll have like a bundle or a loom of multiple coaxials in one, um, in kind of one big like, you know, uh, sleeve. This is like kind of a rubberized sleeve. And it's kind of a hipper way to do a, a snake because it's it's like you know it's already sort of pre heat shrunk for you and it's not really heat shrink it's like the actual uh, material of the of the outer sleeving the kind of the rubberized or PVC or whatever they use uh, something like that could potentially work or you could just bundle you know two standard coaxials of cable that you like like Mogami or whatever and then you could also use like a really thin uh, or thinner coaxial like a twenty three fourteen or something like that and use that for the DC. And on the rack end, you could use a quarter inch if you wanted to have a more robust plug. You could even use a quarter inch on an interface um, that was connecting to the pedals on the pedal board and the buffer as well. Um, and, and then you could convert it to the, the 2.5 millimeter, you know, because all, all you need is just the, the tip and the sleeve. It doesn't matter if, if the protocol is, 
you know, this 2.1 millimeter barrel, or if it's a quarter inch, you could, you could convert it to this on the pedal board side. So you have maybe a little bit more robust cable and connector that's carrying the voltage and carrying the signal. That could be a way to do it. Um, and then, yeah, I just convert it to the 2.1 millimeter when, once it gets there. Um, Teddy Rock. May I ask how your customers use the 9-volt AC port on the True Tone CS12? Well, I don't know that I can speak, you know, to customers generally as I don't really build pedal boards for hire. I mean, very rarely. I, don't, I think the last pedal board build that I did was maybe for my friend Ben Forehand, and before that it hadn't been for anybody except Wendy Melvoin. Um, and so there's sometimes like three-month gaps or more between rig builds. So I don't do it for hire. I do it very occasionally. Uh, usually the only time that you would use a 9-volt AC is for like something like a Whammy or some of the older Line 6 products like the M-series stuff you could use that for. Um, I don't think you can actually use it on the Helix, although I may be mistaken because um, I think the Helix is, is, is DC. So typically those are the applications where, where you see it used. Uh, otherwise, most rigs that I've used this power supply for don't ordinarily even use that output at all. Um, and you're welcome, coffee dude. Um, Stan says, I run my solder iron pretty hot. Uh, I just don't linger. Uh, well, I mean, you, if you run it hot beyond a certain point, you're not really getting any advantage, again, other than just burning out your tip. I think anything over about 750 is kind of not really that valuable. Um, I'm putting a pedal board together. This is from Dean. I'm putting a pedal board together soon. Nine pedals and a patch box. Let's try them in Zuma. I want to keep the cables very tidy. I don't know uh, where to start. Power first, audio first. I usually do uh, power first, and I'll do, I'll put all the cables into the pedals, and then I'll route them all to the source. And you can kind of tell that from um, how I've done it here. Let me just loosen this up a slight bit. So you can kind of tell from how I've done it here, where everything is kind of. Let me turn it a little bit more. Everything is kind of coming into the um the power supply so i start with all the cables into the pedals and then i'm routing it all toward one centralized place and i think that that's an easier way to establish your routing is you're starting you know with all the pedals and again i'm using the molded side of the plug you know so this is the side that that just as it comes from the manufacturer stays on the pedals because these are more likely to take abuse on the pedals themselves so I think that the, the molded end tends to be a little more robust than the newly soldered end, you know, where we're putting the zip tie against it. Because in this position, especially with the riser, like, you know, this is going to come down on it. This is not really going to be touched. Nobody's going to be manipulating this generally or tugging on it. It's the pedals themselves that are going to be, uh, you know, subjected to the most wear and tear. So the molded end I usually keep there. I've seen people do the reverse of this. But uh, I don't think that it's it's uh, the best way to do it. I think that this is the, the best format. And again, starting from the pedals, going toward the source. And this would be the same thing if you were doing a switcher rig. I usually start with the pedals. I wire half of the cable and just leave a really long, uh, you know, un, unterminated end. And then I work toward the switcher. And you have to label your cables and everything like that so you know what's going, you know, where... But um, that's generally how I do it. And then with instrument cables, it's, it's easier in a serial rig like this where everything's in, in, in line. You can, you can get away with having a little less organization. But I usually go uh, power and then to the, to the audio. Uh, okay, let's see. Sorry, just making some adjustments. So we have some symmetry here. Let's see. I'll take a few more and then uh, I'll get back to some more soldering. Um, David, hi, from Cheshire, UK. Just got my Ultraphonics 2. Is it best before or after a Nordland Keeley Super Fat Mod MXR Univibe? Well, I am a big believer, David, and some people have, have said the opposite of this, so you'll have to weigh it with uh, kind of whatever your you know temperament is around, around overdrives. But I usually say putting the higher gain stuff closer to the guitar and lower gain stuff further away from the guitar. And the reason that I say that is that if you already have a real gained out pedal and then you hit it harder with something before it, 
it just saturates it to a place where generally you have less definition. So staggering higher overdrives and distortions close to the guitar and then using less gain after it, you're not clipping the already heavily clipped in, you know, uh, guitar pedal. You're taking the highly clipped one and then you're boosting it with another pedal that has less gain. Um, and presumably, you know, maybe has a little bit more headroom if it's not like a full blown, like, you know, high gain distortion pedal. There are people that do the opposite of this. And I wouldn't say it's, it's a, it's a method that works for every pedal. So you really have to vet, you know, each individual product based on what it does. So on your list, um, I think it depends on the amount of gain that you're using the Nordland OCD Keeley in the Keeley for as far as the Univibe is concerned, I would put that before all of them. I think that Univibes tend to sound more like phasers if they're after drives. So I think closer to the guitar on the Univibe is better. And then I think the overdrive section and the distortion section should be um, aligned based on the one that you use for the most gain closer to the guitar and the one that you use for the least gain further away from the guitar in that sequence of going from higher gain to progressively less gain as it gets further from the guitar. That's my, you know, sort of generalized interpretation. And there can be some, some changes to that that might be specific to your uh, group of pedals, but I think that's a place to start. Corey, ideas for taking a stereo out to a stereo IR boxes and two amps switched uh, switcher switcher or ABI products for stereo. So ideas for taking stereo out to stereo IR boxes and two amps switcher or AB for stereo. Well, it can't really be an AB if you're having stereo out and then you're going to two stereo boxes because you have two signals and an AB is one in and two out. So you would need two in and two out. But I'm not really sure what the what the purpose is of, of doing that. Would it just be if you want to run mono? And in that case, wouldn't you just dismute the one side on your... DAW or your interface that you didn't want the you know the sound to come out of. I'm, so I'm, I'm I'm explain more of what the objective is here, Corey, because if you're running a stereo IR box, I mean you're basically just saying you're running into two cabinets, you know, and, and these are digitally simulated, obviously, with the cabinet and the mic. Um, if you just wanted to use one amp instead of two, you just plug into one amp instead of two, or just one cabinet instead of two. So I'm I'm, I'm wondering about what the what you're thinking the the AB box is going to do for you. Um, Shaky Blue says, love Mogami patch cables. Thank you for the John Mayer pedal board setup. Love my steel string too. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shaky Blues. Uh, then on most rig builds, they are not used. Got it. Uh, I guess it's the CS12. Yeah, not used. Uh, Jacob, howdy doctor. Wondering if you'd suggest running phasers and flangers before or after gain. I usually say before gain, if you're thinking about the classic uses, whether it's Van Halen or, um, you know, Howard Lease from, um, from Hart, like Barracuda, um, or Andy Summers, these are all before the distortion of the amp. So I would say before your distortion pedals is advisable for those effects. Um, for most of us, I mean, there, there could be some people that, um, that might, uh, go the opposite of that. Enjoying the channel. This is from from Sam. The responses. Much appreciated. Yeah, you got it. Stan, how would you go about powering up 10 pedals? Would you go with a 12 outlet or could you use a 6 or 8 in splice? Well, we have a cool video that I think is called Maximizing Your Power Supply. It's probably a couple years old and it talks about if you're going to combine pedals through one output, what the advisable way is to do that. And so it talks about how to make the determination of what pedals are good candidates for that. And usually it's based around whether they're analog or digital. Generally, combining digital effects um, is not a good idea as far as daisy chaining your power or paralleling your power. Usually it's best on low current analog devices. Uh, so those are things like boosts overdrives, those are usually your best candidates. Waz are usually good candidates. I don't usually say fuzz because depending on, you know, what it is, is it PNP or whatever, you can run into some issues there with some vintage style fuzzes and treble boosters with the polarity of the power and stuff like that. And, and it can damage them if you 
run them incorrectly in a daisy chaining context. So I don't usually recommend vintage fuzzes, but I think overdrives, boost, distortion pedals, those are usually good places to start. Wah is a good place to start. Um, those are all, all pretty good. I usually say avoid stuff that has clocks in them because they can often be problematic in this sort of context and you can end up with some weird, you know, intermodulation issues like with phasers, flangers, those have clocks, tremolos, uh, choruses. Um, so those are generally not, not ones you would want to mess with, uh, analog delays. Um, you know, and, and it's not every one, but yeah, if we're just kind of thinking generally, those are kind of ones to avoid combining. And of course, all digital stuff that includes tuners. For some reason, people think that a tuner is not digital. It is. Um, some tuners have a power supply through like the boss pedals, for example, and sometimes they'll do some filtering on that to try to eliminate issues with noise. And sometimes that can be effective enough. Usually with a clean amp, some of this stuff is not detectable. You know, so if you're using a twin reverb, a lot of the issues with your pedal board may not be noticeable until you get into like a high gain context. And then it will reveal all sorts of tremors with the rig. Um, so there's often people that walk around, you know, un unknowingly and their, their pedal board has, uh, has some warts <laughs> that they didn't know about. Um, so just things to keep in mind. Uh, so Corey says, uh, more context. I want to keep both options wired and be able to go to front of house or amps. Um, so I think as far as going front of house or to the amps, um, with your IR loader, most of them have, like, if I'm thinking about the ones I have, like the Sur and the Fryette, they have throughs. So you could run to your cabinet on both of those. And you can also run to the IR mix. And I would just say you just need to make it clear to your front of house person, are they muting the channel with, you know, the first option or the second option? Um, as long as you have a way to communicate with them about what they're muting and what they're not, you should you can just run them all the time and you just mute the channel that you don't want. Uh, and then presumably if you had two cabinets there as well and you're running the IRs, you could tell them whether you want it to be cabs, you could tell them whether you want it to be uh, the IR loader uh, in, in reactive load, or if you wanted it to be one on one side and one on the other side, whatever it is. Uh, that That's something that I think is, is more in the front of the house side um, than anything else. Teddy, I had an idea using an AC to DC converter on the nine volt DC to get some more uh, out of that port. I'm curious about the doctor's thought. I mean, if you have the, the, the right piece to be able to convert it, then uh, bless your heart, go for it. Speaking about high gain distortion, Rev G3 can be used with an Ibanez tube screamer. Uh, I suppose, uh, I guess it depends on whether you like the sound. Total Evo. Would it be detrimental if you're running a modeler with a line isolator and a two microphone setup to a mixer or a stereo switcher? Would it be detrimental if you're running a modeler with a line isolator and two microphone setup to a mixer? I'm with the two microphone setup. Is this like I'm curious how the mics are being involved that you're using like the microphone through the modeler? <laughs> um, Syscom Pro has some good four in, two out switchers. I guess I'm confused as to where the microphones are are in all this. Is this like you're using a modeler into an amp that has two mics? Um, not not following totally here. Uh, totally Evo Seven. Gintana. Would it be possible to use the left and right output of a stereo guitar pedal in two different places, one into a switcher and one into the effects loop of another pedal, uh, not used at the same time? You could definitely do it. I don't know that it'd be advisable because you would get probably a ground loop if you're separating them into different stuff. And also the image of the stereo uh, output is is different on each side. So you would might get a different delay sound and a different mix on one side than the other. Who done it pros for drives I run high gain in the middle and low gain both pre and post. Also do the same with pre and post boost and compressors. And you can do that. I think it's it, it's dependent upon the stuff that you have. RJ Lane, do you have any experience using pedals with a Sir Badger amp? That have power and the power scaling feature. If so, have you had any issues using or any pedal issues with the power scaling? No, um, I've 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 owned a Sir Badger. In fact, we did a video which will come out in a couple weeks probably, 
um, where we use a Sir Badger with overdrive pedals. And the video is titled something like um, pedals that work great into like a dirty amp. So much of what we talk about in the channel is around pedals that are into clean amps. And even the amp that we that we make, the, the Doctor Special, is a pretty clean amp, clean pedal platform designed to put pedals into. We don't often talk about pedals that work great into an amp that's already on the edge of breakup, already gaining. And so we use the Sir Badger as the exemplar for this because it has a really nice kind of broken up tone. You can use the power scaling to kind of get some cooler broken up tones at lower volumes that sound pretty good and, and pretty convincing. I don't see why the London power scaling thing that he does would have any influence, you know, no more than, you know, using a master volume or anything on any other amp might have. Um, I would say that you'd be resp responding more to the, how pedals react with that specific amp than anything else. And Corey, thanks for the time and energy. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. Uh, Stu, I don't know if you've answered this question, but how do you I consolidate the rig uh, of plugs if I have a Moog and a Strymon gear that requires a specific type of power supply? How do I consolidate the rig of plugs? Um, well, the Strymon stuff requires just standard quarter inch plugs and 2.1 millimeter barrel stuff and nine volts. Um, some of the Moog stuff might be a little bit different, uh, depending on what the, what the item is. But, um, I don't know if you're speaking about the power side or the, um, the quarter inch side of things. I'm not a hundred percent sure on the question. So if you could rephrase that, uh, Stu, um, you're saying specific power supply. Well, if it's the Moog stuff, and let's say it's greater than 9 volts, it's 12 or 24 volts, most power supplies now can do that either by using a voltage doubler. If it's, a, say, 24 volts, you can use two 12-volt outs to get 24 um, by putting those two in series. Um, and then with Strymon, you just need a high enough current. And most of today's power supplies, especially the switch mode supplies, can handle any of that stuff, no problem. Most of them have 500 milliamp output standard on every output. So you should have a problem there. Um, Philip says, you said that buffers should be one meg input and a 100 ohm output. I have a Goodwood Audio Interfacer and the output is 500. Should I replace it then? Well, I think that it depends on, you know, it's a baseline that I'm sort of providing to people around the buffer. Like, you know, there may be some higher quality buffers that are higher than 100 ohms. And it's not, uh, I would say, a universal, but it's it's a really, really, it's highly probable that if it's meeting those specs, that it could be really great, and it's likely to be good. Uh, there can also be stuff that's slightly higher that's also going to be just fine and won't have any issue. There are other things at play here in terms of headroom and things like that, which don't factor into that specification at all. So it could be that something that's 500 ohms is just fine. And I think the, 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 the Goodwood audio buffer is, is fine. I don't think you need to replace it. And I, an example of this on the flip side of, let's say something that meets that spec that is not very good is the Klon buffer. So a lot of people have conflated the Klon because it is an excellent overdrive, which I agree with and, and endorse wholly and completely, that somehow that means that it is the Klon of buffers as well. And that it is unmatched and unparalleled in its mysticism and qualities. And that's just not true. The qualities of the overdrive are completely independent of the quality of the buffer. And remember that when any pedal is on, whether it is a clon or otherwise for overdrive and distortion, any pedal that's on is a buffer at that point. Until it either one hits another buffer or two hits another pedal that's on and then that becomes the buffer from that point forward until that pedal either hits another buffer or hits another pedal that's on. So when the clon is on, th anything that is related to the buffer is irrelevant because even if the clon were made true bypass, the qualities of the buffer are present when the pedal is on anyway. So I think this whole thing about, you know, the switch that's like almost always better, almost always worse, with the pedal on, there is no difference between the two. And if there is, then there's something wrong with the pedal or the switch. Um, when it's off is when you should notice the difference. And I think that so many people have be become acclimated to problems in their rig in terms of the impedance and the tone suck that, of course, if you're used to hearing some amount of tone suck and then you bring in a buffer of any quality, even the lowest quality, 
you may notice some sonic improvement. And they attribute that, I think, or overestimate that versus how much it's actually improving the sound relative to something that's actually really well designed for that purpose. So how this relates to the 1 meg, 100 ohm uh, sort of general buffer spec is that a clone buffer actually falls into that category. But they use a TLO72 chip, which is a great IC for overdrives if you like color. In most overdrives, we want a color. We want a sound. We want a certain type of saturation. And the TLO72 has a very pleasing sound, which a lot of people like, and it's widely used in a lot of overdrive and distortion pedals separately from the Klon. However, using that as the chip for a buffer is an awful choice. It's a terrible choice for that particular purpose. It is not a great line driver, and running it down at 100 ohms is not even advisable by the engineers at TI, Texas Instruments, the, the company that manufactures that chip. They will tell you that the chip is unstable under 1K, so they're running it 10 times lower than what is recommended, and you see weird stuff sometimes with those sorts of buffers where they will invert and do weird stuff in, in certain conditions. And so I would not, I think the Klon is an example of something that meets that specification, but is actually being run out of spec versus the type of components that it's using. And it's not going to produce a good sound. So I think this is a case where something like the Goodwood Audio buffer would run circles around the Klon buffer, even though the, the output impedance spec is five times higher because it's actually designed for the purposes of being a buffer and it's designed with the, the foresight to sort of understand what the qualifications are to make something that's a great line driver and is able to drive long cables without any sort of degradation and the components that are chose you know chosen to, to to make this a buffer are keeping those things in mind i don't think that the buffer in the clon was maybe its principal design parameter i think it was an afterthought um, that that was brought into the fold, you know, and I don't know the history of the design of the Klon, but I do know that that buffer is nowhere near the quality of something like the Goodwood Audio or our friends over at uh, Creation Audio Labs that have a buffer that's slightly higher than 100 ohm output impedance, and it absolutely kills in terms of the fidelity and the neutralness of the buffer comparatively to the Klon buffer. That's not to say the Klon is not an amazing overdrive. It is. I will admit that all day long, but the buffer is not so amazing. Okay, so Total Evo is clarifying back about the microphones for two amps. So you want to have two different amp choices, and you want to be able to select between the two of them. I think that this kind of goes back to the Corey thing, where why not just leave both mics on, and then the front of house engineer can decide, do you want on mic one or mic two? Um that, that seems to be the simplest solution. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're asking. Hefe, Golf, Boss ES8, can you run loops 1 through 5 through out 1 and loops 1 through 8 through out 2? Uh, no. What you would do if you want to have different, if you want to run different outputs, is you use the volume loop as the output. So the send would become the output. Like, let's say you wanted to do four cable method, and this applies to any switcher too, and you could you could do this with any switcher that has movable loops. You could designate a loop, and I think in the Boss ES8, the, the volume loop is makes the most sense since it's not immediately available on the foot switches. So like, however you orient it in the globals is how it stays, unless you change it, you know, in, in, the, in the software where you would say go one through five, and then in, in your sequencing of your loops would be one, two, three, four, five, then volume loop, and then you know six, seven, eight, and then output. So you would go one, two, three, four, five, and then send would be the output to the front of the amp, let's say. And then the send out of the effects loop would go into the return of the volume loop, which is an input. And then you would go six, seven, eight in series, and then out would go to the return of the effects loop, the power amp input from there. So that's that's how you would you would do it if you want to have two different outputs with different pedals running each loop. Uh, so total Evo says, so basically, is it bad for the sound to run a stereo modeler to two channels of a small mixer and then another two channels to microphones for a stereo two amp setup? Um, 
Is it bad for the sound? Uh, well, at that point, for most mics, you can get away with a lot more because it's all balanced. So it doesn't have as many of the challenges that you might have with running, say, guitar lines that are unbalanced and single-ended. Um, so, you know, you could try that mic splitter thing if you wanted. Um, but, I, I mean, I guess maybe the challenge is that you don't want to occupy, let's say, four channels where you have, like, stereo amps plus stereo mod, model, uh, modeler effects that would be occupying, I guess, potentially four channels at once if you ran the mics and the modelers at the same time. Aaron, thanks for what you do. I've gotten obsessed on keeping my pedal power cables neat. So you're saving, uh, so I'm saving for an SRV. So more cables. <laughs> Just the power supply. Stu, so what do you mean about the power supply? I want to make sure I answer that question for you. Uh, okay, last two, and then we'll go back to some soldering. Uh, Teddy Rock, oh, by the way, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the Vertex Boost. It's shipping now, but I have a question. Would there be a difference in using an expression in and out or connection to the, the Dunlop volume. The only difference between going to the expression input on a, on a volume pedal or the input and output will be the pot that it uses because most uh, volume pedals will use a 10K linear pot on an expression jack. And they'll either use a 25K or 250K pot on, that's audio taper on the volume pedal in and out. For some people, they're okay with a linear taper and it doesn't seem to bother them. It can tend to be a little bit more abrupt um, and, and, and come on pretty fast and then not have so much changes uh, in, in the beginning and end of the taper or the sweep of the volume pedal. And then the audio taper one may be a little smoother from start to finish. And so I think you just need to evaluate what taper is preferable for you and then you can wire it accordingly to what your preference is. And then last one before we go back to some soldering is uh, I have a pedal that splits my signal in stereo. Both sides are different amp models, but I can easily mute the left or right side. What can I do to add something like that? So both sides are different amp models, but I can easily mute the left, but I can't easily mute the left or the right side. I got it. Um, so you could use a volume pedal um, if you wanted. Um, you could also have some sort of mute switch on each side of them, or you could build some sort of like custom box that would mute one side or the other. Um, or you could use some sort of like splitter pedal before it goes into them, like the Laylee, and you could select like A, B, or both in, in the Y format so that you could have one, the other, or both at the same time. <laughs> NTPL worship. Any tips on growing your hair out? Uh, I think... <clears throat> I, I don't think there's any there's any trick. I think it's just don't don't cut it and uh, you know just keep it keep it clean and 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 in as detangled as possible and and uh, hope hopefully it it comes in good you know and I'd say there's kind of a purgatory where it really sucks where it's kind of always in your face and kind of once you get through that then it's it's a lot easier. Yes, uh, Teddy Rock. So the Vertex, it can be used in both methods. It just depends on, on again, the, what taper you like. You would choose the expression jack if you wanted a more linear taper. And then if you want an audio taper, you would choose the volume in and out. And David, you're welcome. And Stan's WB FedEx just dropped off my TC Stereo Chorus Plus. Great pedal. Great pedal. We did a cool video on it. Let's go back to some soldering. All right. do these two right here so one one tip that I that I employ regularly is you know as I've talked about earlier in the video or in the stream I kind of leave you know the cables long as they kind of terminate into wherever it is that they're going and I leave the the housing off of the uh, the plug so I can kind of feed the cable like directly into place where I want it to be. And so I can literally cut it and it will be exactly the length that I want it to be sort of dressed into the power connector as. So it's it's really sort of the best, uh, most pragmatic technique to kind of address the measure twice, cut once sort of approach. So it just makes it super, super easy to get a consistent result and get exactly 
the length that you want. And so when you're soldering in place like this, it just takes away so much of the guesswork. And then when I'm prepping these cables, uh, I usually just strip out the entire, you know, assuming that the polarity is sort of the normal, you know, pedal polarity, I'll strip the uh, insulation off totally on the uh, ground so that wire is fully exposed. And then I'll take up the minimal amount possible off of the tip because I want, you know, the full benefit of the, uh, the insulation around the center so I don't get any ground out. I'm just doing some tinning here. And if you've never heard this term, tinning is like a pre-soldering. It's sort of like you're preparing the cable to be soldered again. And this just helps improve the flow of the solder as everything's coming together. And I'm just cutting away a little bit more of the, the shield there as we're not going to need as much of it. And then with the plugs... There's a little strain relief that I kind of open up a little bit by just kind of clamping down on it slightly just to give me a little bit more space to solder. And then usually I'll start by just tinning uh, the, the ground here just, just a slight amount. Just tin it a bit. And by the way, this, this third hand here is like just the most helpful tool. This guy right here. Um, I rely on this so much for uh, rig builds, especially when you're in tight spaces. It just is so handy to be able to have, you know, I, I guess I could add more arms. I, I think you can add up to four. But really, I only would need one. Um but it's just a really helpful tool for being able to, to work in tight spaces. And I believe that this is linked in a lot of our rig building videos in the description. So if you're curious about getting one of these, I think it's just on Amazon. I don't think it's like anywhere special. All right, that one's done. Let's go to the next one. We're getting close here. I think after this, we got like one more nine volt and then and then a couple of 18 volt volters. I didn't open it up enough. any pedal board or pedal questions or anything like that you can put them in the chat and I'll I'll come up for air here in a minute and we'll, we'll take a few more and go back to soldering all right let's see how these guys fit in there's one All right, that's looking good. Got one more 9-volt. I'll do this 9-volt one, and then uh, we'll take some questions, and then I'll move to the 18-volt guys here on the end that are powering the uh, Echo Czar and the, uh, <coughs> the uh, buffer interface. I realize I probably should have prepped this one at the same time as the other ones, but 
I have to admit, sometimes uh, keeping two brains going with the uh, live stream and the assembly, sometimes you lose track or kind of go on autopilot a little bit. So uh, a more focused version of uh, this assembly process would have probably done all three of those processes at the same time for each one of these cables. nine volts are done. Should we do a little tour? Let's do a little tour. Let's see where we are. All right. So see there's a few little flex splashes that we'll get up with our tone brush, but we're looking pretty good here, I would say. That's kind of coming up to the top. Let me just move this over a little bit. No, we'll, we'll, we'll inspect that side a little bit more later. But anyway, these are all coming over from that side. And then we'll we'll finish out by doing the two 18-volt ones. Again, that's for the uh, Echo Czar here. And then the uh, custom buffer interface. And... Uh, I know Sean's watching. This was the this was the, one of the additions was putting this guy up on a lift, so it you have plenty of clearance there for the uh, volume pedal to get to that guy. And that that's basically a mixer for the uh, the wet and dry outputs of the whammy mixes that together. But yeah, we're looking good here. We'll just we'll close the top just to kind of get the full view. And I think I had taking this out to check the polarity or check which uh which power cable this was connected to yeah we're looking good we're looking good everything's kind of coming through right from there and working its way down and again just these last two guys will kind of guide them into place and make them nice and beautiful and again i'll color code these guys so that it's clear that it's not uh you know, it's not the standard nine volt stuff in you know in the event that somebody else is working on this that's not me. So let's uh let's invert us again. Let's see if we can all right. Let's see if we can get this right. Uh other questions. All right. Braxel, what's up? Hey, doing good. Hey, doing good. It's Friday. Yeah, doing great. Uh, Noah Mason. Noah Mason. You are awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for all your videos. I learned a lot from you. You are awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for all your videos. I learned a lot from you. Uh, for pure tone, is it better to have a buffer at the beginning? The the end and the effects loop of the amp. Well, it's best to have an input buffer. It, it, you know, there's a few caveats to this, like if you have you know fuzzes and stuff like that, but generally buffer first, buffer last, and then buffer on the return, the effects return. Um, and that's, you know, again, the, the, the return, let me just see if we can straighten us out a little bit here. The return is just an output, right? The thing that people get confused to the 
to the what an effects loop is. It's the send, um, you know, or the, and I guess the return back to the from the pedal board is an output, and then the return on the amp is an input. So send on an on an effects loop is an output, right? It's the it's the preamp output. And then return is the power amp input. So these are inputs and outputs that are subject to the same impedance challenges of anything else with an input and an output. So you're hoping that somebody has a buffered effects loop, which means that the send is low impedance and is going to be somewhat impervious to changes that are going on externally. It's going to be able to drive that line to the pedal board with as few issues as possible. Um, some people do a great job at this, and then other companies do an awful job at this or don't have any sort of signal conditioning whatsoever. And I think that they're banking on that either you're buying some sort of external hardware piece to convert it to an active effects loop, like some of the Dumble style amps do that, because they say, well, you'll just buy a Dumble later or our equivalent of that. <coughs> because if you try to use the effects loop ordinarily, it's awful. Um... And then there's other companies that will make really great effects loops that have, you know, return and send controls so that you can adjust the levels to match the pedals properly and then bring the level back up on the return. And they do a really beautiful job at that. Even if they have that, though, the only part that is buffered on the effects loop is the send. The return is not buffered. A buffer can't work, a buffer can't work backwards from the return back to the pedal board. So the pedal board has to drive that line. Just like the output of the pedal board would have to drive the line in the front of the amp. So I say, yes, input, output, and effects return. Jacob, any suggestions for an alternative pedal to turn on and off reverb and tremolo from a Fender Pro Reverb reissue? Looking to put a pedal on my board, which is detachable. Fender switch is hardwired. <coughs> I mean, you could build one. And I'm sure that there's diagrams online that can show you how to adapt you know, those RCAs to a TRS. Um, I think there's must be also companies that offer this in a sort of a standard Hammond foot switch um, where you can turn it on, on and off the, the reverb and tremolo externally. Uh, so that's that should be no problem. That's an easy thing to make. And I'm sure there's companies that make it, uh, Jacob. Um, top load telly, what's your preferred temp for soldering. I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. It just depends on what it is, but I would say I would never go higher than maybe seven or 750 because it'll just burn out your iron faster and, and uh, it's not going to have any sort of impact. I usually will change the tip more often than I'll change the temp. Um, you know, if I'm soldering some small components, I'll use smaller tips. You've rated people's pedal boards. This is from NTPL Worship. You've rated people's pedal boards, but it would be cool to rate your protege's board, all inspired by Rig Doctor Builders. I don't know how many protege's there are. I think there's just, you know, DIYers that maybe use a few of our tips and make their own way. I don't know that there's anybody who's professionally uh, using our tips, or at least not that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, let's see. Totally Evo 7, would you ever do a future rig incorporating J jet pedals? Also, when will you come with an intermediate vertex board with the size of a mono medium, big size gap between the two are compact and the travel light? I mean, a lot of the sizes are precipitated by the cases that are out there and, you know, the travelability of the rig. Because when you kind of get above the 20 by 11, which is the <coughs> or 20 by 11.5, um, which is kind of the larger or the, the middle size for us, or the second size up from the smallest, is that that's the largest that can be in a carry-on case. So if you want to be able to travel with this rig and take it on carry-on, it's the largest size that you can accommodate. The sizes are also specifically designed for what can be built with ordinary pedals and not exceed the weight limit of most commercial airlines. So this is why we don't have anything bigger than the 29 by 15, because I can't guarantee that if the pedal board is bigger than that with the associated cases that might be available from Gator or from uh, SKB or Pelican, that you'll be able to be under the weight limit, you know, that you would need to be able to move it somewhere without having to pay an overage fee. Uh, could we make some intermediary sizes? Certainly we could. There aren't a lot of case options for those. So, and so what ends up happening is people have these boards that are really undersized for their cases. And so it ends up weighing a lot 
anyway. And so my my gamble has been to to kind of make them the maximum size that they can be and still fit in the common cases that people can get from most retailers. It's kind of been my approach. But I'm not I'm not opposed to that. I, I haven't heard many people ask me for that. And as far as jet pedals, um I I'm open to it. I don't really know too much about them or their product offerings. Um so that would that would be probably the first step. Signal chain, electric guitar, big muff, RC booster, ABY, acoustic guitar, preamp, ABY to the MS3. Do I require a buffer? Um, well, the electric guitar, uh, you would want, I mean, you could also make, just have that ABY box be a high quality buffered ABY box, and that would solve a lot of the problems. The acoustic guitar probably doesn't need it because it's got either active electronics or you're using the Fishman as the buffer. MS3 is a boss buffer, so not so good. Um, so you may consider, um, you know, changing that. I think the Big Shot is passive, or I think the active component of the Big Shot is just for the LEDs. Tone brush, is that an expression? No. Uh, the tone brush is a real thing. Um, and, and any of you can get a tone brush um, at uh, your local Home Depot. I'm trying to find what I did with my tone brush. <coughs> I don't see my tone brush. I guess my tone brush has been requisitioned, but uh, I use this term to describe a paintbrush that uh, I like to use to dust off the pedal boards, and it's a great way to get in between all those small nooks and crannies. Sean Roberts is an audio engineer. I don't agree with the naming scheme. Out should always be sends and in should always be returns, uh, regardless of whether it's on an amp or a pedal board. And I, I'm not disagreeing with that. And I, and, I, and I said so when I was talking about the effects loop, that the send is an output and the return is an input. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that we, we have any disagreement there. I'm just talking about like in terms of how it might be named on the pedal board in terms of how people are, you know, often they'll label an output from the pedal board. They'll put return because it's to go to the return. And so they'll often name it that way and it will be an output buffer that's driving it back into that input. And so that's generally how they'll be named on and in the course of a pedal board. They don't usually call it a send that then matches to a return. It's usually named as the same thing that it's going to. Um, but no, I think... I think that that was corrected in, in my description. You can tell me if you think otherwise. Braxel, do you like R to R electric pedals? I have no idea what that is. I don't, I'm, I've never heard of them. What are your thoughts on supplementing a pedal board with something like UAD plugins at the end of the chain? I think it's great. I think people do it, do it all the time. Plenty of records done like that. No objections. Luis, uh, tone brush is essential to all my builds. Yes, it is. It's essential to everybody's builds. You got to keep it clean. Sam says, I have two pure tone buffers. Where do I put them? I'd say input and output. It depends on what big muff you have. If it's an IC big muff, it won't matter where the buffer is. Uh, if it's a transistor big muff, then just put that before the, the buffer and then put the buffer after that. And then the output buffer dead last. All right. Let's get back to some soldering. I'm still working on uh, still working on those 18 volt guys. I think that should should be, probably be roughly good enough. I'm going to let's see if I have any other heat shrink. I have some green heat shrink for the 18 volts. So we'll use some green here. I'm just gonna cut like a couple of little thin pieces.
And sometimes what I'll do before I even put them down, I'll kind of pre-shrink them a little bit. Gonna pre-shrink them a little bit just so I don't have to like cook the the cable. So here I'll show you how to do this. So I'm I'm just gonna measure these guys out real quick so that I have my my measurements as I want them. All right, that looks about good. We'll strip these guys. And again, I will usually just strip off the sh the shield. I'll take all the insulation off that and then just the tiniest bit to the tip so I can have full coverage of the tip. in these guys and again tinning is just a, a fancy way of saying sort of pre-soldering I'm just opening up the uh, strain relief a slight bit here. I might try this third hand. I think I have enough enough clearance to maybe use this guy, which is a little bit more stable, frankly. Will it work? No, it might not work. Still don't have enough clearance. So back to the... Uh, the longer hands. Just taking off a tiny bit of the shield there. So I don't need all that length. I tin the uh, plug just on the, the sleeve, just a slight amount. There's the ground. Let's get the tip. All right. One down. up a little bit there of some extra wire that kind of came through that we don't we probably don't want protruding all right now I left these guys long enough so that we could definitely uh, fit them over so they can have some color coding a 
interesting to figure out what I did with my the covers. It's all right. I'll figure that out later. I got some extras up here. All right. And so what I'll do is I'll just take this green and uh, heat shrink it around it. It's starting to get a little hot, so I'm gonna give it a break. That's why I try to kind of do some preheat shrinking. I probably could have gone a little bit more to uh, eliminate unnecessary heat to the uh, to the plug. And I use a, a paper embossing gun actually as my heat gun, mostly because it's smaller and easy to get in between spaces. But also, uh, it doesn't get so hot where it, it generally gives you quite a bit of margin, so you don't usually cook stuff inadvertently. I'll still apply my zip tie to both of those but I just have a, a differentiator here so that I know that these two green guys are not the standard voltage of everything else and this I think will just again reduce the possibility of an error if for some reason somebody else is teching this other than me and they're wondering <laughs> if if they're different or the voltage is different It'll be a very easy way for them to identify that at least maybe there's some some difference and that the color of the heat shrink around them doesn't match all the other petals. At least that's what we're hoping. It still looks nice and clean. No, uh, no appreciable difference in look. Let's see if we can maybe do a little bit better, better view here of the whole thing as it stands. All right, let's do a. Let's do a little walkthrough. Can't believe I can't find my my tone brush. This is a crime. To figure out what happened. I guess I could always go to Home Depot and get a uh, get a new tone brush. All right, let's see what we got. All right, let's flip this thing around. All right, let's have a look. So we're starting in this corner. We got the tuner up there, the wah, the volume pedal, diamond compressor. You see all that stuff. This is one of our specialty risers that has all the the holes and everything like that. Let me let me clean off this lens a little bit just so we see everything nicely. So it's kind of got these holes and stuff like that in it, so you can route stuff underneath, which is really handy when you're kind of coming this direction. So it all meets up here with this loom and kind of comes into its various places in the in the signal path and then everything obviously from upstairs kind of comes in in these two places and wires in and then we got our two green heat shrink guys on the corner there for 18 volts and then we got the one nine volt ac that has red on it that's going to the whammy and then the 18 volt guys are going to the uh the delay and then the uh the buffer and this this could take nine volts it could actually take up to 36 but we're just running at the max that uh, is is possible from the uh true tone 
one spot in terms of its DC voltage capabilities. One thing I can also label potentially is this Boss DC2 is going to be on one of the 12 volt outputs. I think it's I think it's this one. Um, so it is possible that I might heat shrink one more here later because this one will be at 12 volts and it'll it'll just be that I flip one of the dip switches there because these older Boss pedals are are um, 12 volt DC. But otherwise, we're looking real good here. Power's done. We got our mixer up there, our expression pedal here for the uh, Echo Czar. So overall, we're looking pretty good. I'm going to move on to audio probably uh, this weekend or next week. And uh, everything is, is looking pretty good here. Let's, uh, let's go back to some, some, final, some final questions. Sorry, I'm kind of blocking the... The camera while I get this resituated. I don't want to turn us off again mistakenly. Let's see if I can get the, a little bit better angle here. Uh, that should work. All right. Let's see. We talked about UAD plugins. We talked about the tone brush. I can't believe I can't find my tone brush. This is this is terrible. It's a terrible day in Tone Town. <laughs> if you lose your tone brush. A tone brush is hard. Yeah, it would be hard to use on a pedal train. Uh, I think mainly because, well, you the Velcro surfaces are tough. Um, let's see. James Garza, I have two one-spot CS6s instead of two power cables coming off of my pedal board. Is there an alternative? I don't want to buy a CS12. Or rather have a small kind of adapter splitter. Well, um, we sell our power modules, which is basically like a two to one power strip. So it's got one IEC and then two, uh, just the standard, you know, AC plugs on it. You could also use, um, a, a different sort of power strip of some kind and put them both into that. Or you could, I feel like there's a rig maybe we did like a couple years ago where you could daisy chain them internally. Um, or you could drill out the led hole on one of them and then run a, um, you know, a, a basically a power cable that you've paralleled off of the IEC input and feed it into the second one. You would just have to get like an IEC cap. So, because um, on the one that we did, a bunch of people brought that to our attention. I put an IEC cap on it, but I just didn't do it during the rig build. I did it like at the end. Uh, and so like there was a bunch of people that, like freaking out. They're like, oh, that, that other IEC plug is live. Um and it would be. So you need to make sure that you have a plug for it. But they Mauser and I think DigiKey both sell molded plastic caps for like a the IEC backing of a power supply. So you just need to make sure you do it to one. I was wondering if I still have some here that I could show you. Um, I'm just looking at my all my kind of materials here. If I can easily identify. Oh, I have one. Here it is. IEC plugs. So they look like this. And it, you can see it kind of matches like what the back of the power supply would look like. So on the second power supply that's being fed, you know, that's being that's, that you're paralleling to, you just put that in the back to make sure that nobody accidentally touches that. Otherwise, they get, you know, 120. Let's see. Uh, Braxel, did you use green heat shrink on both ends of that cable? No, I didn't use it on both ends. I mean, I'm presuming that people will understand that they're 18 volts as it says that it's 18 volts on both these respective pedals. Um, and I'll go through and label the power supply too. So every output will say what it's going to. So, it'll, you know, say like the first plug will say buffer and the second one will say echoes are. So the power supply, I'll, I'll, I'll use the label maker to say what each output is going to, so that's clear. Um, so that'll kind of be the the secondary um, sort of safeguard. Joshua, thinking about using a jet red C for wet, dry, wet, dry effects into red C uh, in, well, the dry effects would go into the amp and then your line out would feed the red C in as the mixer or whatever the last stereo effect might be. Um, 
so the way that you would do it with the Humboldt, I think, is that you'd take all the dry effects and go into the Humboldt. And then I don't think there's a line out on that, but I think there's a send. And then you would use the send to feed all of the wet effects um, or the send to feed the any of the wet effects you wanted to be before the mixer. And then the mixer with all the wet effects that you wanted in the mixer that were 100% wet. And then the output of that would come into the stereo returns of the Humboldt. And that would be the, the cleanest way to do it. Yeah, burnt gerbil. He uses tone brush all day long. Has power grip, as God intended. Just look up power module. That's what I'm looking for. Cool. Yeah. Braxel, I figure if the other end of the power cable is not heat shrink green, someone might put nine volt. Well, I mean, usually you won't damage an eighteen volt pedal by putting nine into it. It's if you put eighteen into a nine. Um, so we're hoping that since it's going to stay, you know, in one person's hands mostly, it should be okay. James or Sam, sorry, James, I misunderstood the question. Yeah. Cool. Well, if there's any final questions about the rig or some of the best practices, I'll certainly entertain them. I'm still kind of bummed out about this tone brush situation. I don't know what would have happened. I feel like I had two tone brushes here. I'm almost certain. One of the, one of the mysteries. Um, Jordan Kibble. So I run two amps, hit the front line of both, and wet through the loop of one amp. Is there a junction box or buffer box that correctly splits the buffers for that setup? So you run two amps, hit the front of both and wets through loop. Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend hitting the front of both amps. I would recommend hitting one of them and then using the send out of the first one to feed your wet effects and then return into both amps. That's how you would generally do a stereo amps with effects loop setup. Because you're going to start to run into some situations where you're going to have phase or polarity problems when you're using two dry sources and two wet sources. So you're better off running everything into the dry amp of your choice, whatever you want to be the core dry tone, and then using the send of one of the that dry amp and sending it to all of the stereo effects and then returning one side of the stereo into the dry amp and the other side of the stereo into the return only of the wet amps. The wet amp, they both have wet effects in them, but one of the amps is only going to have wet um, because you're only going to be going to the power amp return. It's only going to have the, the, the return used. The input and the send will be unused. And none of the controls of the amp will work except maybe the master volume or the presence or if it has reverb on it, that might work. But all the tone controls and stuff like that won't, won't do anything. That, that's how you would do it. Um, the Red Veil. I'm still on my first pedal board, a Furman SPB8C. It has a power conditioner, supplies with outlets would seem convenient but i've heard it doesn't stack up against more you know it's it's there none of it's isolated typically those are pieces of junk it in no way resembles the quality of a firm and power conditioner that you would use in a rack and it's really not even for the same application to be honest what happens when you put 12 volts in a 9 volt input um usually nothing good um people often run pedals at higher voltages than they're designed for with no consideration of what the design is and this happened a lot more when there's a lot of these like 18 volt conversion, um, like things that would come out, like, you know, where you, you would, you put 18 volts in and it would, or sorry, nine volts in, it would convert it to 18 volts and people would just use it on everything because they heard that it makes it sound better. But like, what if the pedal is already running internally at 18 volts? Like a lot of our pedals do that. And then people throw 18 volts onto it. Now you've doubled the current that's already being doubled. So you've just quadrupled the current or the, sorry, the, the voltage. And then you blow up the pedal. And people are like, well, it worked great on my XYZ pedal. Why didn't it work great on this? And it's it's like every pedal is different. There's no there's no standards as it comes to pedals. And so I, I would be very careful 
with voltages in particular and not to just start plugging in higher voltage than the pedal says. And you can always check with the manufacturer first and most of them should be able to answer that for you. Dirty Deeds, I built a four cable IO box using your plans. My final pedal in the stereo chain, if my final pedal in the stereo chain or stereo, could I run one side of my existing IO box and the other side into the JHS little black buffer? You could do that. It won't be the same quality as the buffer that uh, we spec in the DIY buffer. It's like the Klon buffer, which we talked about a little earlier in the stream. I believe that the JHS Little Black Box is uh, the Klon buffer in a consolidated format. Corey Dean, your father now, get used to this. <laughs> Worldwide tone brush giveaway. We need to get some uh, engraved tone brushes, I think. Dirty D's don't want to rebuild the IO box for stereo if I can avoid it. I mean, you could always just build just like a little kind of finger enclosure and just put an input and output on it, you know, like like just something this size and then, you know, input here, output here, DC here, or something like that. And you could use the same buffer that you got. And that's a really high quality buffer in the DIY context. You could just do something like that. Um, Travis, Vertex, my output buffer is too quiet when I'm using a DI box. Any recommendations on a DI, bo DI box that don't suck? Uh, well, there's some active DIs that are great. Um, then, you know, you, there's, of course, all the radial stuff is pretty good. Um, and I, I guess it depends on what it is that you're trying to drive. Um, there's also like a pad on those. And sometimes people have that engaged and so they lose like 15 dB. So also make sure that you don't have that. You don't have that problem. Sean Roberts, could you could just get a jazz chorus and a and have stereo with one small combo. You could, but you'd have a solid state amp, which is not, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on what your baseline is, right? Some people, you know, they, they're they cool with going to Sizzler to get their steak, and some people will only do Ruth Chris. Just depends on who you are. Uh, this is... Uh, Ilmiras, what if you take a stereo pedal and send one output to the front of the amp and one in the loop? Um, you, well, you'd only be able to go into the return, but I, I don't think it's advisable either. Go ahead and try it, but I think you're going to have some, uh, you might have some issues. Uh, blue smoke, what's that smell? <laughs> Oops. Um, Eric, how do you test custom power cables other than just plugging it in? Well, you could use your DVM, your multimeter, right? And you would set it to ohms. And maybe you have a buzzing feature so that it'll buzz when there's continuity. So, you know, let's just grab one that's that's done. That's a completed one here. So here's, here's a completed Strymon. So you would test, you know, center to center with your probes. And you can hear that it's buzzing and it, sa it should say zero. Although, you know, like sometimes like when you move it, the calibration kind of changes. But if it's buzzing, you have continuity and it should read zero. And then you would do the same to the sleeve. So that was the tip on both of them. Here's sleeve on both of them. It's reading zero. And this is how you know, again, like that you have continuity. So like here it is reading zero. And then I would do the same thing with the tips. Again, I already showed you that with the buzzing feature, but I'll just hold up the, the multimeter so you can see. It says zero, I've got tip to tip. And that's how you know that it's that everything is working properly as far as the uh, the cables are concerned. And you can do that when they're on the pedal board too. You can, if they, even if they were all assembled, you could, you know, just use your probes. Again, set it to, to ohms, you know, like the, it looks like an omega symbol. Um, that's how you would that's how you would test them and then if you're just trying to test the voltage then you could leave one side plugged in and then you could go to the tip let's say and then you would adjust this down to dc that's ac dc voltage right and then you you know let's say you plug it in let me just get this thing plugged in and then we'll i'll show you okay so i got this one plugged in right so we want to see what voltage it has so I'm gonna put one of my probes in the center. I'm gonna put one of my probes on the uh, sleeve there. And then I can see that it's at 9.05 volts. So I know now that's DC. 
9.05 volts. And you just want to make sure that they know that you've, you, your polarity is reflected in, in the, with the probes and where you're putting them. But that's, that's how you could test. Easy test. JHS Little Black Box is a potentiometer and two jacks in a box. Is that what it is? Or are you thinking about it? Or is it the... Uh, I thought that's the one, like the little the passive attenuator thing he has. Um, bedroom days. Do you need... Uh, uh, do you need to ground an audition loop interface box with a metal jack if there's no input or output? I would leave them floating uh, on audition loop because you don't know the source that it's going to. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't ground them. I mean, you, you could, and then you could always cut it away if, if it was causing a ground loop. Um, but I would use enclosed jacks, you know, so like the plastic jacks, like, like this style, you know, and there's other plastic styles, so like a Neutrik. And, uh, and you, the way that you could ground it, if you want like an easy way to, um, if you want an easy way to ground it, I'll show you with, um, let's see. I'll show you with like this enclosure, for example, which is a Hammond 1590 BB. So you can see everything's painted right on the outside. And even actually on this one, I think because it must be not a Hammond in some sort of replica, usually Hammonds are clean inside. They're not like this where they're painted. You could Dremel off this paint so that you have a clean surface. Um, and then with this jack on the, on the ground tab and the kind of the top right here, you could solder off a little washer that you would sort of sandwich between the, the wall and the edge of, you know, so if you're kind of looking at the plug from this angle, right? When it comes in in this direction, you would sandwich the the like the tooth washer that would fit around this, so that when you've tightened this down, the washer is making contact with the inside of the enclosure. So that's a simple way to do it. I think that requires the least amount of of friction in order to to achieve, and that would provide a ground of the the jack. And typically, you would do it on on the primary input. So. Um, this would be on the, the jack that feeds the first pedal. So whatever the input is that's coming from, let's say, uh, you know, your audition loop, that's generally where you would put it is on the, is on the input, uh, into the audition loop. And so you could, you could do it there. And then if you were finding there was an issue, you could just cut that wire and remove the, the tooth washer and the, and just remove it. And now it's back to being floating again. So that's what I would do. Another way you could do it is you could drill a hole. And then you could have like a solderable washer, like, let me see if I have one here. Um, all right, here's one. So here's like a, a solderable washer that you could basically drill a hole into your, um, into your enclosure. And you can use like a small little like panel screw like this. And it would feed through the exterior of the, of the enclosure right? It feeds through the exterior of the closure and then you would just, you know, tighten this in, on the inside of the enclosure with, you know, some sort of nut. And then you're left with this little hole that you can solder a wire to and that could be the way that you could ground the inside. But again, the extra step there is, is that you have to drill a hole now into the enclosure and you have to fit that somewhere and then run a wire to it. So there's other ways to do it. And then if it gets, if that didn't work either, you could just cut that wire as well. But it's a little bit more in terms of the number of steps that you need to perform in order to to do what you need. Um, let's see. <laughs> Braxel, now you're talking. A good steak sounds good right now. Yeah. Bedroom Davis. You're the man, thank you, yeah. It's kind of a passive attenuator. It's a volume pot. So is that what the little black box is? I thought that's what they called their buffer. Um, was the little black box. So I might be mistaken as far as what's it called. It's called the little black buffer. Maybe that's what it's called. Yeah, I think that, I think I looked at that once. It's almost the same thing as like the subtle volume control that EWS did for Scott Henderson. I think it's like a 25K or a 10K audio taper pot that's just wired to an input and an output. Um, you could kind of do the same thing if you just put a volume pedal in the effects loop. 
Uh, do you have any experience with CMOS based overdrives? I've gotten myself into the EHX hot tubes recently and it's a weird word overdrive. Sounds like an amp about to explode. Uh, I haven't spent any time specifically looking at CMOS overdrives, although, you know, just like everybody else, I've, I've, there, there, of course, are some that are based in that typology. I don't usually connect with it so much, although I, I know that a lot of people are into that pedal. So, um, and I don't know that I'm sure it could be achieved in, in other ways other than the CMOS in order to get some of those sounds. There's a lot of different ways to get there. Um, our family trips at work, but wanted to say thank you for all your videos. You're welcome. Very cool. Um, all right. I think that uh, I'm nearing the end here. Um, and I think I've done about as much as I can do for uh, this rig today. But uh, we'll continue to circle back on it. Maybe we can do another one of these as, as it continues to materialize. I'll start working on power cables here shortly. And uh, when we get into that, we can, you know, I'll, I'll be using Mogami 2524. Uh, thank you, Sam. I'll be using uh, 2524, or sorry, no, that's for instrument cables. I'll be using 2314. 2314, and I'll be using Square Plugs SP uh, 400s primarily. I don't think I have any need to use SPS 4s, the straight plugs. And uh, uh, maybe on the interface I'll use those. Maybe on the interface I'll use the, the straight guys, because these jacks are a little closer together. Um, but otherwise, I think we're I think we're looking good here. Um, again, this is a serial pedal board, so just kind of one into the next. It should be pretty, pretty simple as far as the wiring is concerned. And then we just have one stereo pedal, which is the Dimension C. Otherwise, everything else is mono. Um, so, cool stuff. Um, and uh, Curtis says, all right, this is a cheat question. Is there a good clone of that big overdrive? Is there a clone of the big overdrive i don't know i don't know which uh which one we're talking about here curtis uh you're welcome gary and uh the one that has the wall plug there's one that has a wall plug what are we talking about here i don't know what we're talking about curtis the wall plug um and sean let's take another look at her before you go oh yeah another look before we go all right here we go here we go let me uh, let me flip this around. Oh, the overdrive recommended by Dumble. No, there's no clone of it that I'm aware of. All right, one more look. So let's let's start out wide here. We got the slash wa, got the tuner there, and uh, got those beautiful wiring looms. I'll probably add one more uh, timeout to here because that gap bothers me a little bit. Not not functionally, just aesthetically. And most of this wiring, you know, is gonna be it's gonna be kind of hidden because also we're gonna have all the audio cables kind of going in, in this little section here. Got the mixer up here. Let's pop the hood. Got uh, all of our nice wiring coming in there. And this is a, actually a custom riser. It's actually pretty short, so it, it's uh, it's it's a pretty low low riser there, um, which which can be good. The only challenge is is that it 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 will put some stress on the uh, on the power supply. So you can kind of when when the when the cables in there, you probably only open it up at about that much. It's the only disadvantage of it being this low. Um, but it will make it easier to fit into a case for sure. Cause this is like, this is like an, maybe an inch and a half shorter than our normal riser size, you know? So it's like barely higher than this pedal on a riser. Maybe the foot switch height is about the same. All right. Was there a last question here? Let's just, let's just see if we got, there's, I feel like there's one more here. Yeah. Curtis, the Dumble overdrive. There's nothing uh, that's a S SOV1. No, there's nothing else that I know that's like it. There's an SOV2, but it's totally different. Um, is the riser on a magnet? Yeah, they're all magnetic. They're all magnetic. So that's how it is on all of our pedal board. Um, all of our pedal boards will have magnets. Some of them will have two, depending on the size, uh, where there'll be like one here and one here. Uh, and then for like kind of smaller ones like this, there'll just be one. But yeah, so that, that's what locks it down. 
and uh, keeps it all in place. So, yeah, one, one more view from the top. It's coming together. It's looking nice. All right, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining. We will see you next time.